British Manufacturing Podcast, brought to you by MTD, MFG and Jefferson. Hello and welcome along to the great British Manufacturing Podcast and to all the Joe Reynolds fans out there. It's bad news this week, I'm afraid, because Joe isn't here. I'm Richard Jordan. I'm sitting in for him this week. But the good news, and it is good news, is we've still got Stuart Whitehead with us to give us all the positive news from British Manufacturing for the past week. How are you doing, Stuart? Yeah, very well. Uh, Thank you, Richard. And uh, yeah, thanks for stepping in this week. It's... uh... I'm looking forward to it, uh, working with a professional for the first time for a while, Richard. <laughs> I don't know what they've told you. <laughs> well, we've got, so there is so much positive news about again, which is brilliant. And also later in the program, let me just uh, tell everybody, we'll be speaking to Nick Thomas, who is the marketing, marketing director at Nissan UK. So some really interesting thoughts from Nick to come. But first of all, Stuart, let's start with one of the great names of British manufacturing, JCB. And I understand we've had a trading update from them. Yeah, absolutely. So the JCB remained profitable in 2020, despite the severe impact of the pandemic on its global manufacturing operations. Incredible growth for JCB this year. They've given um, permanent contracts to well over a 1,000 agency staff. Um, They've recruited in excess of 1,500 people as well, you know, top floor employees um, for the sites across the UK. I was writing this and I thought, well, actually, JCB CEO Graham McDonald um, put a quote out. I'm just going to read the the quote, actually, because it kind of uh, encapsulates what's going on there. So in March 2020, this is Graham McDonald's quote, in March 2020, £1 billion worth of orders disappeared overnight with the onset of COVID-19 and JCB was forced to close its 21 manufacturing plants around the world for, for around two months. Despite the severe impact on its business, JCB remained profitable in 2020 as it has done for the past 76 years. Incredible achievement. The turnaround in 2021 has been dramatic. We are sitting here now in September with four times the usual order bank we had in normal times two or three years ago. As a result, we are ramping up production to levels we have not had before. I have never seen anything like this in my career. So great news from JCB. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Four times. I mean, that's that's not just a, a slight wobble on the graph. That's an enormous increase in business. It certainly is. And you must, you know, managing that business and that upturn in, in fortunes uh, in relative, you know, a relative short period of time is, um, you know, great testament to, to, the, uh, to the management team and leadership of JCB as well, isn't it? Mm, exactly. And I would have thought JCB must be a, a real uh, good bellwether on the state of the economy because obviously they're building machines uh, which people then purchase to do construction projects which shows there must be a lot going on across uh, across the UK as well in the construction industry. No, very good point. Whenever I speak to JCB, that's exactly what they say. They, they say that w- we know before other manufacturers when we're heading into you know, a recession or, or, or um, you know, a boom in, in industry because, as you say, the, the construction industry, um, normally it impacts the construction in- industry earlier um, than, than general industry and it, they tend to come out of any kind of downturn or recession earlier than general industry. So, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. It's uh, They are a great uh, bellwether. Mm. Right, let's move on and talk about Babcock because uh, th- there's a lot of interest, I think, at the moment across the UK in in the Navy, in naval boats. And I think that's due, due to Vigil, the s- submarine thriller that seems to have gripped us all. Well, this is a, it's not a submarine, but it's a thr- thrilling bit of news. There's my tenuous link. Babcock has started constructing the first Type 31 frigate, I understand. Yeah, so the uh, British Defence and Aerospace Group has cut the first deal for HMS Venture at um, and this is the first of five Royal Navy uh, Type 31 frigates. Um, first deal was cut at a new multi-million pound manufacturing facility at Ross Ithe Yard. The new infrastructure um, forms part of a 60 million pound investment program at the site. And this is on top of the further 100 million that has been invested over the last decade to ensure um, the site's shipbuilding capacity, capacity and capability can be optimised with state-of-the-art engineering infrastructure and digital innovation, etc. At its peak, 1,250 people will be directly employed on this 1.25 billion Type 31 program, which includes 150 apprentices. And this will also sustain a further 1,250 jobs in the UK's supply chain. So 
uh, yeah, huge project. And um, Babcock, we've also, re- I think it was a couple of weeks ago, announced well over 300 new apprentices um, and graduates join, join the business as well. So, uh, yeah, lots of good news for the company. And it's so great to hear all this talk of apprentices and apprenticeships, what, 10, 20 years ago. You, you never used to hear apprenticeships mentioned, but they're really, really showing what an important part it is in British manufacturing once again. Undoubtedly, and it's only a few weeks ago that BAE, um, they're taking it on well in excess of, you know, record number again this year. Um can't remember the exact figure, but it's well in excess of a 1,000 apprentices at its sites. Mm. And um, so... We, 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 you know, on previous podcasts, we've talked about the skills gap and so forth. And but unless you invest in apprentices, there's always going to be a skills gap, isn't there? So exactly, exactly. Now, one of the things uh, I've heard listening to these podcasts is how much focus there is on the northeast, and that's where we're heading now. Well, let's talk first of all about JDR, which is setting up a, a new production facility in Northumberland. Correct. Um, and yeah, we need, we need focus on the North East a lot. Uh, so plans have been revealed for a £130 million subsea cable manufacturing plant by JDR. Um, this is part funded by the government's offshore wind manufacturing investment support scheme. And the, the, um, the new facility will be um, built just outside Blythe in Northumberland, which is not, it's actually going to be adjacent or very close to the, the British Vault factory that, that's, um, that's going, um, which I believe is two and a half billion pound investment, thousand to new jobs. So yeah, there's, there's a lot going on in that area. So JDR Cable Systems, which is part of the TFK group, is a global subsea cable and um, umbilical supplier and servicer. The firm has confirmed its intention to go ahead with the project subject to final agreements. Construction is expected to begin in 2022, ahead of a 2024 opening. The 740,000 square foot factory is expected to create 170 jobs on completion and also safeguard 270 jobs at the company's existing facilities. And um, But, yeah, I, I was sent an, a note last night, actually, Richard, about this. And with this investment now, so far this year, the, the offshore wind industry investment announcements total more than £900 million this year. Um, we've, we've covered quite a few of them with GE Renewable, with GRI, um, Siemens, um, a lot is in, you know, in this region as well. So, um, but yeah, approaching a billion pound of investment, and we're only in September. So, uh, fantastic news! It's incredible, isn't it? And um, not to bore everyone with my holiday stories, but I've just <laughs> come back from a, a, a long weekend in Scotland. We were in Aberdeen, and as you fly into Aberdeen Airport, you can see all of the turbines in the in the North Sea. There are there are dozens and dozens of them it's it's a huge growth area uh, uh, around the uk and it's brilliant to hear this this great news as well isn't it undoubtedly and a lot of it uh, the investment has been inward investment as well so um and the jobs being created from it you know it's in the tens of thousands or will be um so it's a relatively new industry isn't it i think it's only really been yeah you know um established for about 15 20 years but as you say um, the infrastructure, the supply chain will benefit as well. And, and a lot of these companies, going back to what we were talking earlier, a lot of these companies are also investing in apprentices and graduates, which is good to see. Mm. Let's stay in the northeast. A new gigafactory in Sunderland. It looks to be edging a bit closer. Yeah, so we have covered this story before, but it has, uh, as you say, things are moving on. So plans submitted by Nissan's battery partner, Envision AESC, for a new £450 million gigafactory in Sunderland, are set to be approved next week. This is scheduled to open in 2024, and the huge investment will create and safeguard more than 1,000 jobs. This is part of a wider £1 billion investment announced by Nissan in Envision in July, which is expected to create 6,000 jobs at the firms and among uh, its suppliers. And I know that you went to, you recently met up with Nick Thomas, uh, Nissan's marketing director, t- to discuss this investment at the Fully Charge Show, Richard. That's right. Yeah, we went down to Fully Charged at uh, Farnborough and uh, Nick Thomas was one of the people we spoke to. He's the UK uh, marketing director for Nissan UK. And it was a really fascinating chat uh, with Nick all about Nissan. I mean, there's a lot of talk around Brexit. Would Nissan stay? Would they go? And certainly the conversation with Nick Thomas was so positive and the company absolutely committed. And this is what he had to say to us. Nick, thanks for talking to us. Begin by telling us a bit about the EV360, if you would. 
great to talk to you. Um, yeah, EV360 is Nissan's commitment to manufacturing in the UK, our commitment to manufacturing the next generation of electric vehicles, and of course to manufacturing those batteries as well, all are based around our Sunderland plant in the UK. So we're creating many thousands of jobs. Uh, we're installing the capacity for up to 100,000 electric vehicles a year on top of our existing capacity for Nissan Leaf, which of course is already manufactured in Sunderland. It's, you know, from our point of view, it's a great uh, sign uh, of the expertise that we have in the UK, of the, you know, the manufacturing expertise that we have, the engineering expertise as well from our Cranfield Technology Centre, and also with our battery partners, our commitment to building a real gigafactory in the UK. It was a massive boost. I think almost the whole of the UK gave a collective sigh of relief when the announcement was made that Nissan was staying and was in fact expanding. Yeah, it was. It, we were really happy with the way, of, of course, it was received, something that's been in the planning for a long time. But we're also very grateful to the UK government for the partnership that we have there. Uh, and, and of course, once, uh, you know, once the future of the UK was, was clear, uh, it was great for us to be able to make that commitment to future manufacturing. Let's talk about the electric vehicles themselves then. Do you, do you still find that the big objection that people come up with is, is the cost of them? I think that's still something people believe is a problem. Um, but you know, it's, it's a barrier we're trying to break down every day. The Nissan Leaf, for example, today is available uh, on a monthly payment for a retail customer or for a fleet customer at basically the same price on a monthly payment as uh, the equivalent petrol car. Uh, and that's before you factor in as a fleet user, you've got thousands of pounds in, in benefit and kind savings from that zero emission uh, vehicle. Or as a retail customer, you know, your savings in fuel, your savings in maintenance are going to be easily 80, 100 pounds a month. Uh, potentially a lot more than that. So uh, on a monthly payment, you're paying for your vehicle the same or less than the equivalent petrol vehicle, and then you get all the savings on top. So those are barriers that we're trying to break down every day that people needn't be concerned about the cost at all. Is it just people look at that initial cost and don't think, you know, over the life of the vehicle, the savings? Yeah, it's, I mean, cost of ownership, we've all gotten used to looking at a monthly rental, a lease plan, um, a, a monthly payment, rather than looking at necessarily the absolute cost of a vehicle. The absolute cost is still a bit higher, although with government plug-in car grants, it comes down uh, and the cost of battery, uh, the cost of battery technology and the cost of vehicles is, is coming down month by month. Uh, so, you know, we need to look at the monthly payment and particularly that total cost of ownership when you factor in the benefits of benefit in kind, uh, the reduction in benefit in kind for a fleet user or for a private user, the reduction in fuel uh, and the reduction in maintenance and, and all of those ownership costs are really what makes the, the difference and makes it so easy to switch to EV now. You mentioned battery technology. Let's talk about Nissan's commitment to, to batteries, to battery manufacture in the UK. We read of the importance of these mega gigafactories being built. Yeah, so obviously with the EV360 announcement, we've committed not only to uh, expanding uh, our existing battery plants, but actually really you know, ramping up the technology so we're ready for the next generation of electric vehicles, which is, of course, coming very soon. And you see the new Nissan Aria right behind me, which is the first of that next generation. Batteries, of course, are at the heart of our electric vehicles, and we're installing with our partners the capacity to manufacture up to 100,000 electric vehicles in our Sunderland plant and the batteries to go with those uh, alongside in the Envision plant in Sunderland. As well as the battery technology, is it important that the infrastructure is put in place as well across the UK? Absolutely. I mean, we've made huge strides in infrastructure already. We have fast charging in every UK uh, service station. You know, I, I just did a staycation tour of the UK myself, and I was really, really pleased to see in so many car parks, you know, high power AC charging and availability of the really fast charging, as I say, on the, on the motorways and around. Um, but we always want more investment. You know? um, it's, it's absolutely essential that we keep that ball rolling. We don't talk about range anxiety anymore, we talk about charging anxiety, that the, the new electric vehicles have more than enough range to complete almost any journey, frankly. Um, but you want to make sure you can charge it when you get there. So that investment in on-street charging, in destination charging, in car park charging, hotels, pubs, shopping centres is going to be key to, to really mass adoption of EVs, which we're, we're right on the cusp of. Nick, great talking to you. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, that's Nick Thomas, the uh, marketing director at Nissan UK. So let's move back, Stuart, and look at some more stories from this uh, past week. And first of all, Don Burr has launched a, a pretty major recruitment drive. Absolutely. So HGV trailer manufacturer Don Burr, which currently employs around 450 people across three manufacturing sites in Stoke-on-Trent, is creating 100 new jobs to help meet um, an unprecedented level of new orders. The recruitment drive, which includes vacancies for welders, coach builders, sprayers and finishers, 
comes as a project to expand the Donbo manufacturing plant in Alderley Green near its completion. So very much uh, um, relevant to, to the news stories of the last few days with the truck and uh, um, driver shortages. So uh, Donbo are, are benefiting from the, uh, as they call it, unprecedented, unprecedented demand. Now, my mum would like the next story because if ever she goes into a pub, and she's 90, uh, once she's had a, a couple of the uh, the hard drinks, she tends to uh, move down a level or two, and she always likes a Britvic orange. So she'll be pleased to hear that Britvic is expanding capacity at its factory in Warwickshire. Yeah, the British soft drinks manufacturer is investing £27 million, pound or £26.9 million for, for pedants uh, out there, um, installing a new canning line at its rugby site, which is the firm's biggest production site. Um, it will produce recyclable 330 milliliter cans for Britvic's portfolios of brands, including Tango, Pepsi, and Seven Up. First cans were expected to produce this November, with a new line fully up and running in 2022. And this investment will increase its capacity at the site by 18% and create a couple of dozen jobs. So, um, yeah, good news for industry and good news for your mum, Richard. Very good news for Mum. Yes, yeah, sadly she's a bit too old to apply for one of those jobs, but I'm sure she'll uh, she'll help them out by having a few cans. So finally, Stuart, let's talk about Perspex, which is uh, announcing a, a major investment at its factory up in Lancashire. Yeah, breaking news this morning. So Perspex International is to invest more than thirty million pound establishing a new manufacturing and development hub at its Chapels Park site in Darwin, designed to make production of the firm's world famous clear and coloured acrylic sheets more efficient and environmentally friendly. The investment will secure 250 jobs. Subject to planning permission, building and production plant, along with the new offices and the R&D centre, will start next year with a target completion of December 20, 2023. And um, I was reading up a bit on the company. I wasn't too familiar. I know the product, but I didn't know the company to, 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 or the history of the company. So production are perspect, including for Spitfire fighter cockpits, began in 1940 when the firm was part of ICI. Latterly, it's been owned by Ineos and Lucite uh, being, before being bought by Swiss-owned 3A Composites. Um, so, yeah, fascinating history and great news for the company and great news for Lancashire. Yeah, I wonder if Perspex has had uh, a good pandemic, if you like, because so many screens have been going up across uh, well, across the world, really, haven't they? No, it's a very good point, actually. I didn't think of that. But, yeah, you, you, would, you would imagine that they have benefited from... Uh, all the uh, different restrictions in, in, in play. But uh, yeah, possibly that's that's what's led to, to this investment. Stuart, thank you very much indeed. That's about it for this week. That's all of the news we've covered. And thank you for, for, for guiding me through this. I'm so appreciative of it. Just a reminder, obviously, if you listen to the show, you found us, but you can hear the podcast. We're available at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and you can also get hold of us at the MTD MFG app. So thank you very much indeed. That's it for the great British manufacturing podcast for this week, Stuart. And I look forward, hopefully, to talking to you again very soon. Absolutely. Thank you for, for joining us, Richard. And uh, thanks very much for Nick Thomas as well, his time. Uh, fascinating interview. And look forward to catching him next week. Cheers. Thank you. The Great British Manufacturing Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and a review. You can find us on Twitter using at MTDMFG and at Jefferson underscore MFG.